All right, everybody, welcome to Call on MacGyver's Creative Temperature and Hazard Controls. Um, my name is Paul, I'm from Ghost, uh, out on Long Island, a uh, board member, and I'll be moderating the course. Uh, right here we have Matt Stinchfield. He's uh, an occupational safety and health specialist with a career spanning 40 years. He began work in environmental, chemistry, wastewater, and hazardous waste. In the mid-90s, Matt began brewing beer. He applied his safety skills to the craft beer industry, and in 2013, he was called to chair the Brewers Association Safety Subcommittee. He is now in his 11th year volunteering for the group. Matt was the Brewers Association Safety Ambassador for eight years, traveling nationally to address Brewers Guilds in 34 states. Matt has been featured in video training assets for draft beer line safety and safety culture. He designed and operated his own brew from 2014 to 2017, winning a World Beer Cup medal in the process. Most recently, Matt has been coaching breweries and distilleries in safety. He has written the first comprehensive book on safety for brewers, entitled Brewery Safety, Principles, Process, and People. And if you catch him after the talk, he has a discount code for his book. Matt enjoys, in his free time, nature, canoeing, trout fishing, and foraging wild foods. So you can tell he's definitely a brewer, jack of all trades. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. OK, so. Um, if you are confusing this handsome guy with me, then you're, you probably weren't watching TV 40 years ago. But uh, oddly enough, uh, that's how long ago this show was on. You may know the term, though, to MacGyver. You've heard the term, even if you didn't know the TV show and where it came from. And in Merriam-Webster, it says, to MacGyver is to make, form, or repair something with what is conveniently on hand. Right? So I'm going to talk today about some solutions, give you some examples of things that we can do around the brewery that more or less directly or indirectly have to do with improving safety that are things that you can do. But first, I'm going to give you the context of what does OSHA think about this, um, you know, making stuff up, inventing things for safety. Is that even a thing? Can, can one do it? So let's, uh, let's find out first. And I normally always set the, the foundation for any talk I give by saying safety is freedom from harm. That's my go-to definition for what safety is. Safety is freedom from harm, and we can elaborate on that and say harm is anything that could cause an injury of a person, an illness, an occupational illness. It could damage the product, your process equipment, or the environment. So harm is Harm is any sort of bad outcome, any bad shit that goes down. Um, and particularly with safety, we gravitate towards thinking about our own personal well-being, right? Did I get an injury or did my coworker get sick from doing the work, that sort of thing. So safety is freedom from harm. And then the tagline below that is safety is a value. So my perspective here, even though I know a lot about OSHA, um, I don't come from the point of view of one must do X, Y, Z, okay? And the reality is it's quite unlikely for OSHA to come up and, and, and choose you at random if you haven't, you know, maimed or killed somebody. They're probably not ever going to show up. The odds are in your favor that way. Um, I'm not saying just, you know, ignore OSHA, but I'm saying if you're looking at OSHA as telling you everything that you need to do, uh, you're going to find that's a very difficult job. And one reason for that is because in many cases, OSHA does not tell you what to do. It tells you general ideas about worker safety and well-being, and it's up to you to figure out the path to get your business there. So every business is going to be potentially reacting uniquely. What I'd rather promote to you is that safety is a function of how well we look out for ourselves, Right? Like, I don't want to fall off a ladder, so I'm going to be cautious in ways that I understand how to be when I'm on the ladder. We look at what we call safety systems, and that is, is my employer providing me personal protective equipment when I need it, and is it the right kind? Am I being trained to use it? And uh, do we have the MSDSs that support, yes, this is the right uh, personal protective equipment to use with that chemical? So that's a relationship between ownership and management and the, and the employee. That's different than just watching out for ourselves. And then the third one, which is not codified in anybody's rule or narrative, is we watch out for each other as part of a working community. 
in, in what we call a safety culture. So in an effective safety culture, we're watching each other's backs and we're doing it unilaterally. We're not doing it, we're not making class distinctions, so oh, that's the boss, I can't tell him to put safety glasses on. Or that's the packaging person that's assembling cartons there of a different class than me because I work on the crew deck. Okay, there's none of that, there's no racism, there's no sexism. In an ideal safety culture that's very effective, everybody's working tribally, if you will, like a small community to keep each other safe. You watch me, I watch you, I do something because I'm not paying attention at the moment even though I know better, and you remind me about it and we improve it and go forward. So those are, that's the social component that holds safety together. Now, let's get back to OSHA. Does OSHA tell us what to do in terms of our safety requirements? Yes, and here's how it does that. In the original formation document, this is not even the regulation, this is what superseded, the re what came before the regulation, which was the law that was passed by Congress and signed by Richard Nixon in 1970. So over 50 years ago, OSHA was created, and they were charged with this. Make employers responsible for creating a safe and healthful workplace free of obvious hazards. And make the employees do their part too, which is to adhere to the training that they've been given, using the safety equipment properly that they've been given. Presumably you've been given some of these things, right? Uh, but it's neither the boss's responsibility solely or the workforce's responsibility. It's a cooperative effort. And the genius of that is that that's a 50-year-old keystone of OSHA, is that we're all in this together. So it's, it's sometimes easy to think, you know, we on the floor are all doing things as safe as we can. We just wish we had more resources. And, you know, the boss is the craziest one of us all, and that's really a problem for us morale-wise. Yes, there are businesses like that, but there are also businesses where the employer is like, why aren't my people doing better at safety? I really want them to be safe. I want production to keep continuing and to go without a hitch. Um, but they can't seem to pull it together. It is neither of these things. It's not an us or them, right? It's us all together. That's how we do safety. And the general duty clause is what it's called. This is like before any nitty gritty of OSHA rules, first and foremost, understand the employer has a responsibility to create a safe and healthful workplace. Safe and healthful are code words, by the way. Safe means free of injury, and healthful means free of occupational disease or illness. Okay, that's the way those, word, those two words were used in 1970. So the historical context of it is, is it was pretty comprehensive for one little phrase to capture the employer's responsibility to keep your people well, whether it's from an injury or from some long-term malady that they get from, you know, breathing silica dust or whatever. But also, and the part that we easily forget, is that the employees have this responsibility. Okay, that's all well and good. Now we understand everybody's in this together, but um, how do we do it? Does OSHA tell us how to achieve this? How does the employer create a safe and healthful workplace? How does the employee receive training? What is that training? Does OSHA tell us? And the answer is sometimes, kind of, okay? And that's really disappointing for a lot of people because you'd like to, if you're gonna to have to dig into these OSHA regulations, you would like to find a place where it says, do A, B, C, and then you're good. Well, there are places where OSHA does that, and it, OSHA uses two dialects in its narrative, in its regulations. And the first one I'm talking about is what's called prescriptive. It must be this way. And you may think that OSHA is generally like that, but in fact, that's the minority of the OSHA regs are like that. Okay, now if we're talking Department of Transportation, it's all prescriptive. So much tire pressure, a placard on the thing has to be such and such a dimension and such a color and such size print and this insignia and yink, 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 everything has to be exact. But in OSHA, there's only a, you know, a percentage of the regulations are prescriptive. And here's an example. Okay, if you're working at a working surface, 
greater than or equal to four feet above the floor, so let's say a brew deck, you have to have a railing of, at the exposed edge so you don't fall off that four foot working surface. And that railing has to be 43 inches high, plus or minus three inches. And then there's another prescriptive reg that talks about the second railing that's halfway down, okay? Now, that is prescriptive. If you're going to use a railing, it needs to be that high. And I've seen public safety inspectors go, come out with a tape measure and go, your railing is too short. And theoretically, that makes it more possible for you to fall over the railing. So that's, that's the kind of OSHA that a lot of us think we're dealing with. Uh, another example would be in chemical exposure. OSHA has specific limits in terms of milligrams per cubic meter of dust in air or parts per million for a gas or vapor in air. And it says, above this number, you need respiratory protection or you need some other serious hazard control. Below this number, everything is fine. You can breathe that stuff all day long, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for a working lifetime, and you only have like a one in a million increased chance of getting sick. That's a lot of black box number mumbo jumbo, but it's the law. And so when OSHA says, the time weighted average, that's the eight hour average exposure of a worker without respiratory protection for carbon dioxide is 5,000 parts per million. Anybody know what the ambient, like air, CO2 right now, what is it here right now? Hundred parts per million. You're in the right, you're in the right neighborhood. Where it, you know, like when I was born it was 415 and now it's like 435 because it's going up all the time. Right, but um, this is not a political class on environmental ethics. <laughs> so, uh, but let's say four to 500 parts per million. So four to 500 parts per million, we're all fine, no big deal. But at 5,000 parts per million, we start to suffer physiological effects that might include, begin with things like a headache, nausea, and dizziness. And it gets, it gets worse and worse. And we're not talking about asphyxiation at 5,000. We're talking about the beginning of a problem. And that's, and OSHA has decided this. And that is called the, the permissible exposure limit, the PEL, and it's in a table in OSHA's regulations. And if we're trying to figure out if you're breathing too much CO2 in the workplace, we measure the CO2 in the workplace and we compare it to 5,000 and we say, yes, you're in trouble, or no, you're fine. As if we're all biologically the same. By the way, these rules are built on a, on a theoretical model of an 18-year-old white male worker and their working lifetime going forward and presuming that they're not exposed to any other hazards in their lifetime, right? It's a fiction, it is fiction, but it's also the law. So these are prescriptive examples in OSHA. Some of them are real helpful, like a railing, 42 inches, that sounds about right. Um, 5,000 CO2, I know somebody that in 1,500 is getting a migraine every time. So 5,000 is, is, is way too much for that individual because we're all a little different. Then we have the other kind of language that OSHA uses and we call that performance oriented. And I'll give you an example with fall protection. Performance oriented would say, if you're on an elevated work surface, do whatever you need to do so that the worker can't fall. That's the way most OSHA is written. <clears throat> it might give you suggestions. In the case of fall protection, it says you may use a guardrail system or you may use a fall protection device that anchors the worker so that they can't take a grounder, right? But brewers are gonna go for the railing. They're not gonna go for the harness and the clip-in and all that stuff just to work on the brew deck. But you, you gotta have something. So OSHA says, you know, um, if you're on a walking and working surface, like if you're on a ladder, which a walking and working surface is anywhere you put your feet, okay? So that's gonna include ladders and platforms and catwalks and uh, forklifts where you're standing on the pallet and your buddy's, you know, lifting you up to the top. No, okay, <laughs> just testing. I got a little laughter, so I know you're, I know you're paying attention. Here's the thing about performance oriented because this is our gateway to being able to MacGyver things in the brewery. 
the hazard control is up to the employer. So the, 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 the specific prescriptive reg says 5,000 parts per million CO2 is the limit. But it doesn't say how to achieve that. It just says keep it below that. If you go above that, you need to supply a respirator. But if you go below that, you don't need anything. So the real game we're playing with safety most times is reduce the hazard to a low probability. And, and, and there's, there's no like we have to be 99% complete. We just have to like make a good effort. That's all OSHA is asking us to do. And as a reminder, OSHA's rules are the minimum legal requirement. You can do better than OSHA. So if you're holding up OSHA as this impossible, you know, high watermark, I just want to give you the perspective that that's actually the low watermark, and you can do better um, and in case in like kettle boil overs. OSHA has no burn standard. There's no rule for hot stuff at work. There's no rule for ergonomics in OSHA. And two thirds of the small injuries that people like brewers get exposed to are soft tissue injuries, sprains and strains, lacerations, and musculoskeletal injuries, bone and muscle injuries, okay? All of those things are ergonomic in most cases and, and there's no OSHA standard for it. So sometimes OSHA has a hole and you can go, well, that, you know, there may not be a reg, but we should be doing something, you know? We should say that when we're lifting half barrel kegs, we do it to a two people buddy system. No matter no matter who who's on your team and you know thinks they can handle it. So if you're going to control it in any way that you want, the only thing OSHA says is this: use whatever is feasible for administrative and engineering controls. I'm going to give you examples of these on the next slide. And if after that you want to use personal protective equipment, you can use that as a control. And that whatever it is that you decide to use as hazard controls should be overseen by a qualified person. And that's a pretty loose definition. It just means somebody who knows what they're dealing with on that particular thing, okay? So if, uh, if it was about carbon dioxide, you, a qualified person might be somebody who says, I know how carbon dioxide behaves in the workplace. It's denser than air. It generally accumulates in the lower elevations in still air, but in turbulent air, it could be anywhere. I know that it comes from these sources in the brewery. I know that it's liable to be higher in these parts of our manufacturing process. That would be a qualified person, AKA a brewer, okay? So the bar, OSHA sets the bar pretty low here, but here are the, here are the, the things to keep in mind. So here's a situation of a canning line and the fellow is, is needing to be at this location on the canning line and there's exposure to CO2 above background levels, right? Remember four, 450 or so is background CO2. This is at a th over a thousand parts per million. So it's a little bit higher than day-to-day -day air. Probably not a problem for this individual yet, but this is, we're only looking at this moment. There, it might jump up over 5,000, might jump over 10,000 from time to time. But the, the idea is that this employee is potentially exposed to carbon dioxide. So if we're gonna take a performance-oriented view towards how do we lower the individual's exposure, let's look at those three classes I just named. Excuse me, I keep doing that, there we go. So first of all, uh, in what we call the hierarchy of controls, the first thing we ask is, can we eliminate carbon dioxide from our process? Probably not entirely, right? Some people are starting to play with nitrogen and substituting CO2 with nitrogen, which works in some applications, but beer still has CO2 from its fermentation process. Um, and unless you're canning or bottling with nitrogen, you're gonna have fugitive CO2 at a packaging line like this. Then the other thing that you can do is you can start looking at what we call administrative controls. Administrative controls don't use equipment so much as they use the mechanisms of, of running a business, the, inner, the you know, management tools. So for example, we're going to teach everybody on the canning line where the CO2 is highest, 
and we're going to show them it's not good to hover close, it's better to stand back until you need to come in and say, remove a can for sampling. Um, or we can reduce exposure administratively by saying, you're, you know, everybody works the canning line for four hours and then you go work on the pack off while somebody else works on the, on the filler. Okay, and you just, you rotate people so nobody's getting an all day experience at that, at that risk level. Okay, so the, all of these that I've shown here are called administrative controls. Engineering controls are real MacGyver turf. That's what we're focusing on today. These are things that are done with bits and bobs, with pieces of equipment used either because they're designed for that purpose to control a certain hazard, or because we're gonna put things together and make them do something for us that controls the hazard, reduces the risk. Okay, so in a CO2 environment like this, one thing we could do is active ventilation. We could put some shop fans in there and we can move a lot of fresh air through there and dilute the CO2 and that worker is getting a lower CO2 exposure as a result of that, right? We do this in cellars all the time anyways. We can do it at a packaging line. Or passive ventilation, we open the garage doors at the back of the packaging hall and just let fresh air kind of mix in. Probably not as effective, but might be effective enough for us, okay? Um, or maybe we can figure out how to reduce the emission of CO2 from the canning process, you know, where, where are those bursts of CO2 taking place and can we minimize them and still get acceptable DO in our product? Can we still get the right carbonation in the can, okay? So those are all engineering tweaks that we can do. And if we fail at all of those things and we still can't get the CO2 controlled, we have, in the case of CO2, have no option other than to put everybody in SCBA, in, in supplied air breathing systems, which would just like turn every brewery into a science fiction thing. <laughs> so like, remember the word feasible was in quotes on the last sign, slide. So is it feasible to eliminate CO2 altogether? No. Is it feasible to have everybody in supply air respirators? No. Those are the two extremes, and that's where feasibility is just not achievable. So where is it achievable? Pretty much every other thing we've got here. And here's another thing about hazard controls. OSHA doesn't tell you you have to use just one, or you have to use a specific one in most cases. So I say use what you can, usually multiple controls, so you've got some redundancy in it. Kettle boilovers is a perfect example. I can, I'm not gonna do it for time, I can list two dozen different hazard controls to prevent kettle boilover, okay? You don't have to have all of them. You probably would never get your beer made if you had all of them. But you could have two or three of them, right? You could have a foam sensor, you could have a hose handy nearby, and you could use a foam control additive in the boil. You could add hops early in your NEIPA just to create hop break, not to add bitterness to the beer, right? You could do it because hops have the property of breaking foam once they're boiled. Okay, don't forget that. It's like old school brewing knowledge back from the thing called the English IPA. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, you can tackle the boil over problem in any choice of hazard controls you want. Right? Maybe it's even something administrative, like we're, we're not going to brew beers that are designed to throw haze because they have a lot of high protein unmalted grain in them. Because those things also increase foam over possibility. So we're gonna, we're gonna make lagers, you know? It's a kind of a, it's an elimination way of avoiding boil overs. So, this is what we're working with. Now, um, and, and this is just to remind you what we're talking about. MacGyvering is really in the engineering control category and sometimes it's a little bit in the administrative control. We cannot MacGyver PPE. And the reason is, it's because every article of personal protective equipment that is, has something like an ASTM or an ANSI certification has been tested and permitted under explicit approval requirements. For example, you can't take the respirator cartridge from one respirator brand and put it on the face piece of a different maker. And by the way, they never fit 
for the very reason that you're not allowed to do it. So every manufacturer has a unique way of attaching the cartridge to the face piece. Um, gloves, boots, safety glasses, none of that stuff you can mess with. So no MacGyvering on PPE. Okay, so let's just look at some really, this is like the simplest example I could think of. Here's a grain hopper for specialty grain on the left. It's got, it uh, goes right down into the boot with the, with the, the, you know, the chain auger or whatever is in there. Uh, and if you drop a piece of equipment, a tool, your, you know, your box cutter, whatever, down in there, it's gone, it's in the system. And remember, safety is freedom from harm. Harm includes damaging property or equipment. Uh, or, or your product. So um, this would be a possible harm, yeah? To drop something other than malt into this hopper. And then over here, this is a, a homemade grate that goes over a very similar hopper. It's a, not the same one, but it's the same size, uh, that keeps you from dropping all but small items in there, okay? This is perfectly acceptable MacGyverism. Um, and, uh, you know, OSHA's gonna, OSHA inspector would recognize that there's a possibility of something either getting broken if a foreign object falls down in there, or somebody's hand. That's really what they're gonna think about is, can your hair, your long hair, or your hand, or your necklace get down in there uh, and get caught up? So, very, very simple example. We really reduce the possibility. What could we do about, um, uh, if I drop my box cutter in there, that might still go into the mill. What might I do to control the box cutter? Put a string on it. Put a string on it, okay? So there's an engineering control that anchors it so that it can't fall down in there. What if I could substitute a box cutter for something that doesn't fall through there? For example, I buy malt that has a pull string on it and more and more have quick opening bags now. So that maybe isn't acceptable because you're like, I have to have this brand of malt and it only comes with the red twine and it's gotta be that malt. And so you go, okay, well now I need the box cutter so I'm going to tie it off. And I'm gonna have this grate here so that nothing else like my phone or the grain bag falls in there. Okay, now we're gonna get a little more MacGyvery where we're, you know, we're putting different things together and seeing how they might work. Here is uh, an actual setup in a brewery where there's a carbon dioxide monitor in the cellar and when it hits a certain set point, it turns on these shop fans. Okay, active ventilation. We know that's a good control for CO2, but there's like, all the other jobs we're doing in the brewery, do we remember to turn on the fan? And do we know when to turn on the fan? If we keep the fans on all the time, they need more maintenance and we use more electricity, that's not optimal. If we never turn them on, that's not optimal. How do we know to turn them on when we need to? This way, you know, you can look at that number and go, well, at 2000, we turn on the fans. And if you happen to look over at the monitor, which is all the way at the end of the cellar, right? and you see, oh, it's 2,500, I need to turn on the fans, if you remember to turn on the fans, if you know that standard operating procedure. In this way, we've automated it very simply, just using a relay from the output of the monitor. Okay, uh, how many of you have built one of these for testing your pressure relief valves at home? Two of you, congrats, okay. So three of you, great. So here's, this is just a little bit difficult to see, but this is an, an apparatus for taking the pressure relief or pressure vacuum relief off your vessel and putting it on this little apparatus that has a gauge on it and testing to see at what pressure that relief valve relieves. And what you see here in the center picture is that's the regulator on the wall, the secondary regulator, right? Your compressor might have 175 pounds coming out of it, PSI. You don't want to be putting that into a device that's meant to go off at, say, 29 PSI or 22 PSI. So you, down, you turn this regulator down to zero. You, you attach it through the hose on the bottom here. 
this this brewer uses a little ball valve there, which is like, like, that's like pro value MacGyver. You don't have to have that valve, but if you do, because you know when we're dealing with pressure, it's always not, or in liquids or gases, it's nice to not do things instantaneously, right? It's nice to do it gradually to turn valves, uh, you know, a little bit slower than we might need to, just to sense what's going on. And uh, so in this case, the pressure comes in here. He sees what's on the, on the oil field gauge here, and he's comparing it to what's on the wall. And in that way, he's kind of measuring the, the quality of those two gauges. Like they should be, at, if he's doing it at two bar, they should both be at two bar. Uh, he, his wall gauge was at two bar, and he was at 1.9 bar on the gauge in his hand. So somebody's not real accurate, or they're both off. Uh, but good enough for this kind of job. Then on the other side of the T, he's attached the pressure relief valve. And by turning, uh, opening the valve below him and then turning on the wall supply slowly and turning it up with that Allen key, he doesn't go right to three bar. If it's set to go off at two bar, he creeps up on it at two bar. You don't hear it hissing, right? Without the valve, you can just go and psh and they go, okay, yeah, it, it works. It's not schmutzed up from Kroizen that got up in there and got dry, or for other reasons. Um, so so uh, you just turn that up gradually, and then the gauge in his hand doesn't go up anymore because the PRV is slowly releasing all the excess gas above two bar. And then you can see he's got his PRVs all lined up and he does them regularly, hand details them because Especially if you're doing that old trick about let's make you know let's make 18 barrels in a 15 barrel tank. You don't get me started. Uh, this is a major cause of boil, boil overs and dry hop volcanoes. Uh, and you get stuff up in the dome of the tank that Kroizen and Hopschmutz and it gets up in the PRVs and it dries and the CIP doesn't get in there and it doesn't function when you need it to function. And boy, you really want those things to function when your tank is over or under pressurized. So that's a great, that's a great one and uh, made great, basically with parts most breweries are gonna have on their, on their cart. Okay, here's, uh, this is a classic one, which is retrofitting a brew kettle with a foam control device. And what that is, is a sensor that picks up the rising crown of foam over an active boil, right? And then turns off the heat to the kettle. And then the foam can go down and then the relay flops the other way and the steam can come back on or your other source of heat can come back on. So in the diagram here, we're just showing you that a, a vessel can, it would be nice if all brew kettles came this way reality. Uh, a couple years ago I walked around the CBC trade show floor and looked at 14 different brewery manufacturers and one of them the kettle came equipped with a foam sensor. Two of the other breweries were like well yeah we can do that if you ask and, and the, the remaining 11 just looked at me like what? <laughs> Seriously the people building your equipment don't even know about this key safety feature. And 30 years ago I'm dating myself but when you used to buy uni tanks back in the day, they didn't even have a flange on the dome for a PRV. They were, uni tanks were not made with a PRV fit, fitting. And now, quite often, you still have to ask for it and pay extra for it when you're ordering your unis. So, um, I mean, at least people are talking about them now. They, it should be like standard in the trade. So, uh, a sensor is installed, and Kent Taylor here in Nashville, he, um, he's a tinkering engineer. He's like, he's like uh, you know, Grandmaster MacGyver level. And uh, he built this whole breadboard with all the circuitry in it to not only turn off the steam and turn it back on, but also lock the manway on the kettle with a pneumatic lock uh, when there was an, uh, when it was in a boil over crisis. Yeah, so, and I know another a brewer in Phoenix who MacGyvered, uh, and, uh, and I can say this because I'm not here on the BA's time, uh, 
McMaster Car, if you don't know about this company called McMaster Car, it should be on your quick dial. Um, they sell all the stuff that MacGyvers need, and um, you know, you can- It's overnight. <laughs> and overnight, you, you'll never know what the shipping is until it arrives, but it's okay, because they have everything. Um, but um, you know, using McMaster Car Parts, he was able to um, uh, put a pressure transducer inside the dome of his kettle, and, and if the pressure was other than ambient, the manway hatch wouldn't open. So if you have a condenser and you're pulling a vacuum, right, um, things can change dramatically when you open the manway for hopping. And uh, this makes you zero out the pressure differential before you open the manway. Um, you know, there are brewers I know now, especially with, you know, so much of the late, late kettle addition, big, big kettle additions happening is they cut the steam to add the hops and then bring the steam back up a little bit. Um, there are all different ways of, 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 of uh, tweaking your kettle that way. But this one, you simply take the probe, which is like a, 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 a liquid conductivity detector, right? It's just detecting the electrical current passes through the hot foam, but it doesn't pass through air. So when the hot foam comes up and touches the sensor, it completes the circuit, sends a signal, and you can, if you have automation, you can send it to a PLC uh, controller, which will then uh, turn on or turn off a steam valve somewhere. Uh, or you can simply do it with a relay uh, that just opens a switch to cut off the, the steam supply. And so maybe that's a, a motorized steam valve that's operating on a 20 volt, 24 volt DC setup. Um, but you can retrofit a tank for, I think all this fancy stuff that Kent did was under 1500 bucks. Um, the, the guy with the pressure transducer and the, and the lock said he did that for 250, $250. Um, but he's also a welder, so you, know, you have to factor that in. But still, this is the kind of thing that you can do and it's improving your well-being in the job. And OSHA's not gonna be so granular as to say, well, they don't even have a heat or burn standard. How are they gonna say to avoid splashing boiling liquids or to avoid contact with steam? There, there's, there's, there are no rules for that. The only two heat standards in OSHA are um, burns from welding and burns from uh, electrical arc contacting a, a high voltage panel. And those burns, you know, um, especially the arc flash, you're probably dead anyway, so why have a control? Just, that's, that's just like dark humor. Okay, um, here's, here's one uh, where there's, you know, there's kickback from the mill. A lot of people have smaller mills, they're dumping specialty grains in by hand. There's this churn of dust that happens above some mills. Some mills, it's coming out every crack and crevice of the mill body itself, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Not everybody has, right, like, the choice mills, right? We, there's fugitive dust. And that fugitive dust can lead to building up to where it could be a, a, an explosive dust hazard. And it contains lactic acid, which is a beer spoiler in most breweries. And so we don't want that all around. So managing dust is good for us, it's good for the product. So this brewer uh, took part of the space over the top of the, the hopper and applied a vacuum to it and then built this, what's called a bag house. So this on the right here is a, a large perforated bag. Think of like a grain bag, right? It's got little holes between the fibers. Uh, although you buy these from McMaster Car in whatever pore size of microns you want. So maybe this is a 50 micron filter or something, and then they, they just hose clamped it onto the top of a barrel and used an explosion-proof vent to get it from the hopper into the bag house. And all the dust ends up in the bottom of the barrel. Super cool, cost for MacGyver, 250 bucks. Okay, so you can do this, and I'm gonna show you a cautionary tale, a couple of cautionary tales now, and then if you have some questions, we can chat. So, great. So I wanna um, be clear that not all MacGyvering is going to be in your best interest, right? 
You might, right, you've been in breweries where everything's MacGyvered, things that shouldn't be MacGyvered are MacGyvered, and, uh, you, you know, are maybe putting you at more risk. Here is a brewery that decided we're reducing the risk of climbing on a ladder or other thing to get the PRV off the dome of the tank, so we're going to mount it on the sidearm, right at eye level. When does a PRV go off? Whenever you don't expect it. <laughs> Where are brewers walking? Back and forth up the cellar. Now, there is a simple MacGyver to this. I, I only just discovered that these are actually made, but you can make one yourself, is to put a, a larger diameter piece of plexiglass over it like an upside down can. And if it does blow beer or high pressure CO2 out, it gets deflected straight down that way. Okay? Now, ideally, your PRV never goes off because of all sorts of other good engineering controls in your process. <laughs> and it's just there in case something gets missed. But you could put a shield on it, and it could be the thing that, if the thing never happens and the other thing never happens, then at least it goes to the floor. Um, the next one here is a homemade CIP system. And what I don't like about this is it was so obviously made with parts on hand like all the two long pieces of stainless tubing that we had, right? Nothing's cut to fit, so it's sticking out into the lane of, of travel here. Um, none of it's protected from being hit by a forklift or a pallet jack or somebody's shin. So, uh, yeah, and it, 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 it's hard to see from this picture, but there is a mixer motor on the back vessel. Um, I can't tell where the pump is or if it's only done with a mobile pump, but I just like, it was on the borderline of like legit MacGyvering to a little too janky for me. And then one more of these, um, here is, it, I, I did see a brewery in Chicago, which I won't name because I can't remember it, but their entire super sack dispenser was made of two by fours. <laughs> This one's at least made out of four by fours, but it's still homemade. And you're talking of, you know, maybe 23 pounds in that bag sitting on top of that. Um, I don't know where this operation is. Is it in an earthquake prone area, right? If you've ever seen a, a super sack dispenser, they're made out of some really baller steel. They're not small gauge. They're really designed for a lot, like maybe even bumping with a forklift. Um, and then just for, you know, extra points, uh, we see that red motor behind him has a gear drive on it with a chain, and that's completely unguarded. And it's at a place where one might get their hand or their hair. So, uh, and then the third one I'll add to this is, when the bag is filled, how does it come off of that? It drops by gravity, and then the person is manually schlepping, so we've got a for sure, like ergonomic risk going on there. So, um, and then the other thing is that the earmuffs are all, you have to zoom in on it, but they're all caked with malt dust, meaning they're not being worn. So that's four things that I see with that picture right away. Um, the, the last one is based on a, a small brewer I know that has their grain mill and hopper is in the cellar, not the brewery cellar, is in a basement underneath the main floor of their brewery. They go down in a, a basement to, to mill their grain. And it accumulates all this dust in this moist basement, and it was a problem. And uh, it was a janky old mill, and it made a lot of dust. So they installed a piece of dryer hose with a shock vac right at the hopper. And so while they were getting that dust kicked back from the rollers, they'd vacuum it into the shock vac. Anybody concerned about that setup and why? Is a shop vac a piece of rated explosion proof motor? Probably not. So, I mean, there are very expensive shop vacs that are explosion proof, but the one you buy at the big box store is not explosion proof. So, what I would be worried about is something like this setup here, where it's really just a cheap shop vac that's not designed for handling potentially flammable or explosive dust material. Um, so, you know, don't, don't, don't go to the wrong place with your MacGyver. With that, um, let me just summarize for you and remember that 
it's the employer who creates the safe and healthful workplace, and that OSHA allows you to do these engineering controls, but first, if there are prescriptive regs, follow those. You know, if there's a, if there's a specific reg that applies to your thing, do that first. Um, for example, if you're trying to MacGyver a worker to a high elevation to the third level of your storage rack, and you think that forklifting them up there on a pallet is a good MacGyver, there is a prescriptive requirement for doing that, and it requires, a, there is a device that goes on a forklift for doing this, but it has a manned personnel page around it. It has railings, so you have to have that. Um, if they have prescriptive regs, use them first, and if they don't, then it's maybe fair game for MacGyver. In the hierarchy that we talked about, substitution and elimination should be first. Can I get rid of the hazard altogether? If we're talking about MacGyvering a solution, that means you couldn't get rid of it altogether. You're trying to reduce it. Can I reduce it with signs, procedures, training, shift work, something like that? And if not, then maybe I can MacGyver it. And that's engineering controls are really where we end up MacGyvering things. I think of engineering controls as any sort of uh, tool. You know, it could, be, it could be a simple tool. It could be a mechanical device um, for controlling where the hazard is, you know, to keep it away from us. And then lastly, remember that personal protective equipment may not be MacGyver. So if you haven't seen it yet, this is the book I spent three years writing. It came out last year in Brewer's Publications. Um, it is the only book we know of that's on brewery safety. And if you like my perspective of safety, which is not all chapter and verse of OSHA, then this book might be for you. And I have coupons. Uh, as Paul mentioned, so come see me afterwards. I'll give you a card with a coupon code on it, and you get 10% off. And with that, did this bring up any questions for you? Um, so in your like order of operations or like hierarchy of solutions, you have administrative controls above engineering controls. Um, that's just the way OSHA laid it out. Um, and I will thank you for bringing this up, though, because I will say that <clears throat> the one thing that's missing here is in this hierarchy is what we call safe work practices, or I call thoughtful actions. Like, what does that, remember, safety begins with us. Like, how do I act? And what is the importance of those actions on my own safety? In 1970, when OSHA was created, it was very much big labor and horrible freaking businesses that were polluting the earth and killing their workers. That was the context in 1970 where OSHA was born. And so it had very much this sense of put as much of this on the employer as you can. But as psychologists and anthropologists, sociologists have gotten into safety over the last 50 years, what they found is there's there's like a human behavioral component here that's almost like essentially impossible to regulate. And that is like, how would you regulate common sense? You, you can't, but you can create a safety culture where people are reacting the same way to things. So here's a, here's a, here's a common sense one. Uh, I see a, a colorless liquid spill on the floor in a brewery that I'm just going through. I don't know anything about their processes. Do I assume it's water? It, maybe it's likely to be water, but do I, Matt, assume it's water? And I go, no, it could be caustic, it could be acid, it could be some, it could be glue, I don't know what it is. Uh, it could be somebody's body fluids for all I know. It's, but, it, but I'm not gonna step in it. And by simply not stepping in it, by taking two extra steps to go around it, and to say to my friend, hey, you know, you, maybe you want to get that cleaned up or put a sign on it or something. That's a safe work practice. See, it doesn't require any special equipment, and it doesn't really, it's not an institutionalized administrative control. It's what you might call the zen component of safety. Like, I know that that could be bad, and I'm acting accordingly in a way that doesn't otherwise distort what it is that I need to do here. Okay, so um, OSHA doesn't, contemplate that, it doesn't have it in its hierarchy. For me, 
it, if it were my hierarchy, I would put, I would go substitution, uh, I would go elimination, substitution, thoughtful actions. Like, don't be an idiot. That's thoughtful actions. And then after that, administrative controls and engineering controls. See, administrative controls are like a way of doing business, and engineering controls cost bucks, because we're, we're buying stuff. It's material stuff. So um, in the way of spending money, administrative controls could save you more if you can do it with administrative. Um, like, you know, just reorganize the shift. Um, uh, but, um, or, or say, you're fired if you jump off the dock instead of go down the stairs. That's an administrative control. It might not work for every brewing culture, right? Like, screw you, we're still jumping off the dock. Go ahead and fire us. Couldn't possibly replace us. <laughs> well, we'll try hard after you break your ankle, you know, and we, this goes nowhere. This is just like a bad family argument. Um, whereas, on the other hand, you say, um, we're going to make it easy to go down the stairs by making a change in the staircase or where the stairs are and maybe make it a little more difficult to jump off the dock, and then we'll let human nature take over, we'll let that thoughtful action take over. So, yeah, good for pointing that out. That, that not always going to be one before the other. Yeah. Let me ask you this before, if you don't have any more questions. How many of you are surprised to find out that OSHA is this open to the way you solve your hazard problems? It's pretty surprising, isn't it? Yeah, because I think we're enculturated to think it's all like chapter and verse. Um, and there's a lot of chapter and verse, but a lot of that chapter and verse basically just says, do something so that this doesn't happen, or do something so that it's minimized. And then, and then that's where you get to have a little creative playtime. Thanks very much. If you have a late question, come catch me. And uh, appreciate you being here, and make it a safe day with you. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matt.